All right, well, welcome everyone. We will go ahead and begin. So again, this is the Developing an Effective Tutoring Program for our K-3 students. I am Dr. Julie Baisden here at Florida Center for Reading Research at Florida State University. And we have several people joining us today to help with um, some information as well as answering any questions that you may have. So we are very honored to have our Department of Education um, representatives join us. We will go ahead and move around the room to um, allow everybody to introduce themselves. So we'll go ahead and start with Lindsey Brown. Lindsey? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lindsey Brown and I'm the Executive Director of Just Read Florida. We are excited to be collaborating with FCRR for these tutoring trainings, and we know you're excited to get your tutoring program started at your schools. Um, so thanks for being here with us this afternoon. Okay, and we'll hand it over to Monica Reeves. Hi everyone, I am a reading specialist with Just Read Florida. I'm excited about our collaboration with FCRR and happy to be here to help this afternoon. And then I believe we also have Randy Shiver joining us as well from Department of Education. Good afternoon, everybody. Another fellow reading specialist here at Just Read Florida. Happy to be here to help you along with the training today. Welcome. And then we do have Nathan Archer on the FCR art side, helping us with all things technology. And then also joining us, we have Dr. Kevin Smith. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. And then we have Dr. Jennifer Gans as well. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming and joining us this afternoon. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So during our presentation today, we will be using the question and answer box to answer any questions that you have. And then we'll be using the chat box as well for um, some thoughts and reactions from you throughout the presentation. So both of those um, options will be available and our panelists will work to monitor those questions as they come in and um, answer them accordingly. And then if there's any um, questions that come in that need a more uh, lengthy discussion or a phone call or a follow-up Zoom meeting, we are happy to uh, schedule that with you and talk at a more in-depth level. We are going to uh, record this webinar and it will be posted on the FCRR website very soon for you to go back and review with others that may have not been able to be here today. Or as you go through the implementation process, you can go back and refer to the PowerPoint and the recording. And then lastly, we ask that you keep a positive mindset as we move through this uh, process of implement, implementing a tutoring program and know that the Department of Education, along with FCRR, is here to support you in this initiative and um, make it successful for um, all schools. This is a part of an email that district received, and it is a document in which you used to register for previous webinars or webinars that are coming up. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Randy and or Lindsay to take a few minutes to talk about the different options as far as pathways go and uh, additional training dates that have been assigned for the different pathways. Sure, so this schedule was our original schedule of tutoring trainings. And we since added two additional opportunities, which are both um, today, we had one at 9 a.m. and one today at 3 p.m. And that was based on district need after we offered the first two sessions of developing an effective tutoring program. So developing an effective tutoring program is the first required session that all districts and LEAs are required to attend for the Reading Tutoring for K-3 Students grant. And then after attending this session, districts and LEAs are required to select a pathway, which is on the bottom half of that schedule, um, or you can choose to do both. So pathway one is the RAISE High School Tutoring Program training, and pathway two is effective and evidence-based practices for tutoring. So we've already held a couple of those sessions for pathway one and pathway two, but we have one coming up tomorrow morning for Ray's High School Tutoring Program at 9 a.m. And it will actually only be from 9 a.m. to 1030. And then on Thursday, March 31st, we have effective and evidence-based practices for tutoring 
from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. So we hope to see you in one or both of those sessions this week. All right, and both pathways are a uh, train the trainer type model. So we will be working through uh, ways to train your um, tutors, whether it's pathway one or pathway two. So if you have any questions about registration or you need the link, you can reach out to uh, Department of Education or here at SCRR and we'll be happy to send you the link for tomorrow and or Thursday. So we're gonna briefly just go over our objectives for today. So our goal today is to help you as a leader in this initiative to gain a better understanding of how to um, develop a evidence-based tutoring program. And then to understand why we um, are wanting to implement tutoring into schools. Then we also want to allow uh, the opportunity for um, the review of some current practices that are also evidence-based and that can be used in your schools, and then um, guide you to some places that you can find additional resources and professional learning material to use with your literacy leaders uh, within the district and at your school sites. And then also provide you with tools and resources that will help guide you as you make um, key decisions throughout this implementation process. So the purpose of this funding is to support uh, district initiatives in uh, providing support to students in early grades. And um, it, this is an added effort to help close some of those academic achievement gaps that we are seeing across the state. So as you're aware that research shows that students that are not at or above grade level by third grade have a more difficult time in making gains in reading. And so we're really wanting to focus on the earliest of learners that are demonstrating those difficulties in um, literacy and reading and help establish those necessary foundational reading skills that are needed to become stronger readers. So in addition to helping strengthen those foundational reading skills um, through tutoring, tutoring also provides the opportunity for students to develop a positive relationship with a designated person that is really going to help them and cheer them on throughout their academic journey. And then lastly, the reasoning behind implementing tutoring is to work on creating a partnership with teachers in um, efforts to regain some of that lost instructional time that we have seen. And it also provides teachers with an additional layer of support in the classroom when working to address the wide range of diverse skills that are seen within classrooms today. So as mentioned before, this is a partnership with the Florida Department of Education and the Florida Center for Reading Research or FCRR. And between those two, um, there is a shared vision of what tutoring will look like in and across our Florida schools. And again, the primary purpose of the tutoring initiative is to connect students in grades K through three with older students, um, paraprofessionals, volunteers, retired teachers, current teachers, all people that can serve in um, that tutoring role and really provide that additional layer of support for students who are struggling um, with their reading skills. And then again, tutors are going to work alongside teachers and with schools to form a team and work towards reducing those academic gaps. So what is the definition of a tutor? The basic definition, which all of you are familiar with, is a tutor is a person who provides additional support to students. It's important to note that um, anyone that is part of the community or the school community can be a tutor. And again, reading tutors may include but are not limited to our high school students, our college university students, retired teachers, and or community volunteers. So we recognize, and most community members recognize that literacy is important for all children. And so this is a unique opportunity to involve the community and community partners in tutoring and to help grow a successful program. So we really want to, to utilize those community members and community partners in this initiative and effort. 
However, keeping in mind that a wide range of people um, can be tutors, it'll be important to provide uh, the proper support and training, and that'll be a critical component throughout this process. But with the proper support and training, tutors can be a powerful tool for students and teachers to use within the schools. So the key here is really going to be having a well-developed and structured program that allows school sites time to not only oversee tutors, but the opportunity to coach tutors and provide feedback on effective instructional techniques, and then allow tutors the opportunity to really work on building and fostering those relationships with students, teachers, schools, and then lastly, the community. So the first step in this process of developing and deploying your tutoring program is what we're going to refer to as an implementation team. And organizing an implementation team is going to be important because this will be the team of people that um, make key decisions about the criteria and also the structure of the tutoring program. And the implementation team is going to be um, a team of people at the district level as well as people at the site levels. And then understanding that implementing and monitoring a uh, effective tutoring program is really gonna be an ongoing process. And it's going to need the continued support of district leaders, administrators, literacy coaches and teachers throughout um, the program performance period. And we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, one of the, the roles um, when looking at the implementation team is that the implementation team is going to need to work together to identify their roles and responsibilities. And some of these roles and responsibilities and decisions will be made at the district level. And then some of these responsibilities and decisions will be unique to school sites. And we do want to point out that this implementation team is not necessarily a new group of people. It could be an existing leadership team or literacy team that's already in place at the district level or a leadership team or a literacy team that's already in place at the school sites. So when thinking about the roles and responsibilities of the implementation team, some tasks that you should consider um, assigning to the members of the team are going to be one, identifying the criteria for tutoring. And we're gonna go over um, the criteria for tutoring but that will be a decision that um, you'll need to work through with your implementation team. That's one of the uh, roles or responsibilities. One of the big roles and responsibilities of this implementation team is going to be deciding how you're going to recruit tutors to participate in the tutoring initiative. And then not only recruiting the tutors, but also providing the proper training and support to those tutors. In addition to recruiting and training, you will also um, need to work through how tutoring sessions will be scheduled and then how you will register students for your program. Progress monitoring will also be another element that will need to be discussed and decided upon. And then um, it will be important that the implementation team work together and communicate to really work um, on creating a seamless program. So again, remember that you will have district level um, people making decisions, and then you'll also have school site um, members making decisions as well. So it's going to be really important that those two levels communicate and work together to really work um, and, and to make an effective program. So we wanted to pause for a minute and use our chat box um, to share how your district plans to recruit tutors. So we're going to ask a few questions throughout our presentation today, and it's a great opportunity for um, everybody in attendance to learn from each other and to hear some other ideas. So if you uh, would take a minute and go ahead and type in how your district plans to recruit tutors, and then we'll give you a minute to do that, and then we will go ahead and keep going why people are typing in the box. Right. So at this point, districts have been provided with funding to help coordinate this tutoring initiative, 
And we wanted to take a minute to review some of the assurances that are listed within the grant. So first and foremost, by being here today, you are receiving the initial training by FCRR, and there will be resources available on the FCRR website, website very, very soon that will help your implementation team not only train tutors and school level administrators in evidence-based practices for instruction and reading mediation, but also provide you with some guidance on making some of these key decisions. Another assurance that we wanted you to be aware of is that it will be important to not only provide the initial training for tutors, but also provide that ongoing support and training as needed. And then finally, districts will be working with FCRR to collect data regarding um, the number of students served, learning outcomes and learning performance after students had received um, tutoring instruction. And we did want to take a minute to note that the evaluation process is still under development. And once those um, details are finalized, those evaluation plans will be sent to districts and district leaders. And this information um, will be shared with uh, the Department of Education. And um, you, again, will have more information about that come um, summer or early fall. So at this point, once you have decided on your implementation team and the people that will make those key decisions, the next part of this will be deciding what curriculum that you will be using with students that need that additional support and literacy. And the design of the reading curriculum or the instructional plans that your site chooses should um, reflect practices or instructional practices that have been empirically shown to support gains in student achievement. In addition to this, the supplemental program should incorporate elements of explicit and systematic pathways to really teach those foundational reading skills. And then the material and or program that is selected should also be engaging for students, and it should be easy for tutors to follow after the tutors have received proper training and support. Supplemental programs that are selected for tutoring may be embedded within the core reading curriculum, or they may be a standalone program. And we're going to hear more about embedded curriculum and embedded materials in just a minute. But at a minimum, the program should include elements of phonological awareness, phonics, and fluency components. But um, this is at a minimum. But we do want to note that the other foundational reading skills, such as oral language, or academic vocabulary and comprehension are also extremely important in the um, development of reading skills. And we're focusing on the phonological awareness, phonics, and fluency aspects because we're really targeting our K-3 learners and we're really looking at those um, foundational reading skills and, and um, solidifying that growth and development. So we have Dr. Smith joining us, Hello. and he is going to talk a little bit more about a study that was done and looking closer at embedded materials. And we wanted to take a minute to spotlight embedded materials because we know that many districts across the state are, are doing phenomenal things and using resources that are truly effective. And so we don't want the tutoring program to be a burden. We want it to be um, a nice, partnership with what you're already working on. So Dr. Smith, can you talk a little bit more about the embedded materials and how they can use that? Absolutely, Dr. Baston. Thanks so much. So as uh, Julie mentioned, this was part of a study that we did a couple of years back, and I work under the Regional Educational Laboratory Southeast, which is part of the Institute of Education Sciences, the research, research arm of the U.S. Department of Education. Um, so the REL Southeast did this study, and what we found um, in looking at uh, results from 55 elementary schools across the state of Florida, and actually Dr. Jenny Gans, who's also going to share with you in a few moments, was our site coordinator for Broward County. That was one of the districts that was part of the study. We found that honestly, looking at um, intervention materials, uh, if you use materials that are embedded within your core program, that can be as effective as standalone intervention materials. And there's a couple of reasons why. Um, an advantage to the embedded materials, they're cost effective. You already own them. 
I worked in Title I schools my entire career. I could go to any closet, probably at any Title I school in the state and find a lot of embedded intervention materials that are already there. Um, and they, the good part about them is they're already aligned to tier one classroom instruction. Meaning if you're using materials like this um, that are aligned to your tier one instruction, students are already familiar with the concepts and the approach that's taken in those materials. If you use a standalone product, it may take a very different approach. And sometimes for students who are struggling, that can be confusing. However, the standalone may also have parts that students need that may not be as explicit as they need to be in the core program. So you just have to keep that in mind. Um, however, if you're using the embedded materials, you, you really can't implement them straight out of the shrink wrap package. You really have to unpack them, develop a scope and sequence and figure out exactly which parts your students need and how to develop that small group tutoring session. Um, of course, training is important no matter what you're going to use. A lot of researchers have found that if any kind of tutor is well trained in the materials they use, of course, it's going to be more effective. And of course, model uh, monitoring implementation of tutoring for fidelity is also important. But I just wanted to mention again, this was an important study because we did find that using materials that are embedded with the core program, materials you probably already have at your schools, can be as effective is a standalone that has a strong evidence base if they're used effectively. And again, you create a good scope and sequence and they're um, created to prepare students for parts that they need additional support in. So thanks again for joining us and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Payson. Sure. So as um, your implementation team is looking at selecting materials, if your district or site already has a program in mind, um, or you are looking to um, select a new program for the tutoring initiative, we um, encourage you to visit these sites. So this is Evidence for ESSA and What Works Clearinghouse and Proven Tutoring. And Dr. Smith, would you be available to put those three links in the chat for us? Yes. And these sites are uh, a great tool and resource because not only um, have the sites aligned the resources with the reliability and validity, they look at the reliability and validity, but they also will let you know what elements of reading the program focuses on. So is the program that you're using um, focusing on the phonological awareness or the phonics or the fluency? And then lastly, is the program um, effective or intended for your K-3 learners or intended for those early foundational skills. So again, we encourage you to go uh, look and explore these websites to um, learn more about the programs that are at your site or that you're considering implementing at your site. So thinking about materials, we um, are going to use the chat box again, and we would love for you to share a curriculum or program that your district or your site has used that you have found effective for uh, K-1 students or K-3 through students. And again, this is an opportunity to uh, see some other things that are happening around our state and what other districts and schools have found to be effective. So if you're looking for some ideas, we will um, allow you to type those um, ideas in the chat box. And then thank you, Dr. Smith. He has linked those three sites for your review as well. And um, this program or this webinar along with the PowerPoint and all the links will be shared um, on our SCRR website. So um, continuing with program selection and material, whichever program your district selects, tutors are going to need the materials provided to them along with training. And so the webinar that follows this presentation um, in Pathway 1 or Pathway 2 will really help train literacy leaders on how to train tutors in the basics of effective reading instruction, and then where to go to find supplemental resources that will help um, support classroom learning and align with classroom learning when working on those foundational reading skills for your students in your K-3 tutoring program. And then again, the tutors are going to need um, support from literacy leaders at the district and the school sites as they work through the implementation of the program materials. 
So one additional um, material that tutors have available to them and schools have available to them are the student center activities on the FCRR website. And this is a link and we'll link it in our chat box for you to review as well, is a link to the student center activities. And they're a great supplemental um, resource to use in your tutoring program. And Dr. Gans has worked very closely with the development and the realignment of the student center activities. And she's gonna share a little bit more um, about how to use this resource and uh, what to look for when, when selecting a student center activity to use with, with some of your struggling readers. Dr. Gans? Sure, hi everybody, how are you all? Um, we're happy that you're here with us. And so let me catch you up a little bit on the updates to the student center activities. Um, certainly the student center activities have been around for a long time and many folks have been using them for lots of years. Um, we did go ahead and revamp them uh, at the end of 2021 and, and into early 2022. All student center activities have now been um, updated with uh, more functional language and graphics, uh, things that, you know, we maybe don't see overhead projectors, things like that in the classrooms as much anymore. So those types of things have been updated. We've also um, taken away the need for black line masters or activity masters. Everything is digital now. So when you go online, um, either to our uh, main web page where it has the Florida Center uh, Student Center activities right at the top bar or on our four educators page, which has both the um, regular activities and the ones that we've aligned. And I'll talk to you about that in just a second. Um, you will see that everything you need for each activity is downloadable right there, including any student pages, any uh, things you would need to implement this activity. So the student center activities um, clearly are not a curriculum on their own, and they're meant to be used for uh, students to practice, demonstrate, or extend their learning of what has already been taught. They do work well with most any curriculum or any supplemental piece. Um, they can be done as independent items. If you look at the graphic on your screen, there is um, the, the little, there's two little people at the top of the uh, vocabulary graphic there that indicates the number of students that could do this activity. So sometimes you'll see it's meant for multiple students. Sometimes it's meant for just one student. So depending on, on the tutoring situation, that'll help you know, the tutor know uh, or the teacher or whoever know, you know, that the size of the group they can use for this activity. Um, we also have extensions and adaptations to all of the activities uh, to scaffold them either up or down, depending on the level of the students that you're working with or that your tutors are working with. Um, when you do go uh, on the FCRR website and you look at the four educators site, and I will put that in the chat link, um, you'll see that there's an option for the regular student center activities, which is all of our activities, which is well over 300 plus activities in grades K to five. And you'll also see a link to the standards on, on, like on the screen that have been aligned with the new best standards. Clearly not all of our activities are a direct match or an alignment, um, but it, they, we did match as many of the activities as we could to, um, to align with the new standards. So you can certainly use our filter tool to look for uh, a standard or an activity or a grade band. It's, it's a really neat tool and that should help you depending on the grade level that you're working with. Um, we also have on, this, on the same page where the student center activities are, I, in either link, um, you will see at the bottom the teacher resource guide. And this guide specifically was written to help uh, learn how to implement the activities um, definitions of things like, you know, book, uh, phonemic awareness or fluency or things like that. So someone who may not be as versed in it can have a working definition. And um, it talks uh, about reading centers and all kinds of things that are on the teaching, the teacher resource guide. So I will, um, I will make sure to put all of those links for you in the chat so you have them readily available. Yes, and, and to piggyback off of what Dr. Gann said, they are designed, the student center activities are designed for really anyone to be able to implement, whether you are looking at uh, working with high school students, 
up to uh, retired educators. They are not geared um, specifically for teachers um, to only be able to use and to um, be effective in implementing. So they, they are really a nice pair to be used with um, any type of tutor that your district or site uh, selects. So thank you, Dr. Gans, for linking that in our chat box. And so why we are on student center activities, if you have any questions uh, regarding student center activities, you can certainly put that in the chat box now, but we would also uh, like to hear from districts and schools what student act, uh, center activity have you seen used in a classroom? Do you have a favorite? Um, and so this is an opportunity for you to share with us. If you are not familiar with the student center activities, we certainly encourage you to visit uh, the links above to explore that resource. So we're going to turn it back over to um, Dr. Kevin Smith, and he's going to talk a little bit more about this practice guide that was created through IES. And so, Dr. Smith, are you sure. ready? Uh, yes, I'll be glad okay. to talk about this practice guide. Yeah, so absolutely. Thanks so much. We thought that this would be a helpful practice guide to share and the Institute of Education Sciences and the What Works Clearinghouse has created 20 plus practice guides like this that really are a wonderful compilation of research that's out there. So this particular practice guide came out in 2016. It's called Foundational Skills to Support Reading for Understanding in Kindergarten through Third Grade. And again, it's well aligned with the tutoring that you're undertaking right now. Um, so basically when they create these practice guides, they get panelists together um, from across the country, usually researchers along with practitioners and others to look at research. And in this case, they looked at the last 20 years of research after the um, National Reading Panel report that came out in 2000 to um, determine what really are the strongest recommendations to focus on for foundational reading skills. So what they found um, in our former director who just retired a few years back, Dr. Barbara Foreman was the panel chair for this particular practice guide. What they found was that we need to teach our students academic language skills um, and vocabulary knowledge. And that's not just for K-3 students, we should be doing that ourselves even as adults. So that's a recommendation that spans across all four grades and even beyond that. The second, developing awareness of the segments of sound and speech and how they link the letters really begins in kindergarten and uh, goes up until you know first, second grade, you start to see it fade out. Then the third, teach students to decode words, analyze word parts, and write and recognize words. Again, would start um, in kindergarten and fade out in third grade and beyond. And then decoding words, analyzing word parts, writing and recognizing words. It depends on the text and the difficulty. Some of those things we still need to work on as adults. If you give me a medical text, I'm probably going to need to focus on those things as well. Um, then the last, Ensuring that students read connected text every day to support reading accuracy, fluency, and comprehension. Again, that goes across our grades all the way through adulthood. So one thing these practice guides do well is break down these recommendations into really clear how-to steps to show teachers exactly how to carry these out. And then also they talk about potential roadblocks. So what are some issues that a teacher might run into uh, or a school if they're trying to implement these specific practices. These are, this isn't the only practice guide. As I mentioned, there's 20 plus, there's ones on math instruction, on behavior, on school improvement. They're all out there, they're free. Again, they were created by the US Department of Education. So um, you know they can be helpful for multiple topics and they really are a wonderful compendium of the research that's out there. And usually, again, collected over a 20 year time frame. They also have at the end appendices that actually lists the references and quotes from those um, studies that this is based on to show you exactly why these recommendations were chosen and the strength of the evidence behind them. So I will put the links to both this practice guide and to a professional learning community that was developed by the RHEL Southeast to help implement these practices in the chat so that you have those resources as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Julie Basin. So these practice guides are great because they can really serve as um, curriculum if you're looking to work through like a PLC setting with your literacy coaches or maybe your administrative teams, you're looking to review some of those um, foundational reading skills with administrators 
or understanding the importance of literacy, these practice guides really serve as a great um, a review of some of those necessary and important skills that we may or may not have um, visited in a little bit. All right, so looking at our um, implementation of our tutoring program, one of the big questions, and I've seen it come up in the chat a few times, just glancing through some of the questions is, who will we tutor? So the implementation of the tutoring program is intended for our K-3 students, and we're really prioritizing our K-1 students who need that additional layer of support in reading. So again, this is the funding and the uh, tutoring initiative is for our K-3 students, first and foremost, prioritizing our K-1 students. So going over um, or looking at deciding about a criteria and selecting your students, progress monitoring data should serve as the foundation in which your district builds the criteria for tutoring on. So each district should have a reliable progress monitoring tool that accurately measures what students know, and then more importantly, how they're progressing through um, out the year, and then in this case, specifically how they're progressing as they receive additional support through the tutoring program. So the progress monitoring, again, will serve as the foundation for the criteria in selecting students to participate in the program. And um, again, it's a critical component when tracking students and seeing how uh, they progress and they grow in the uh, specific area of need that has been identified. So districts will determine the criteria for students who will participate in the program. And this can be based off of your district assessment data or progress monitoring data, or uh, using students that have uh, been identified as having a substantial reading deficiency at this point in the year. So however um, you decide to select your students, you will want to base it off of data. So that, again, will go back to that implementation team and some decision making at the district levels of who will participate in the tutoring program. This site, intensiveintervention.org, is a website that has tested the reliability and validity of many of our progress monitoring tools that are used across the state. So we encourage you to um, explore this resource to not only learn more about your progress monitoring to tool, but to see um, if the tool that you're using does indeed measure what you are wanting to measure and that it's appropriate for K3 learners. So if you already have a progress monitoring tool in place, we encourage you to visit this to learn more about your tool. Or if you're looking to um, add another tool to your school site or your district, this is also a great site in helping make some of those important decisions. So again, we want to use the chat box for you to share with us what progress monitoring tool are you currently using with your K3 students. So again, this is an opportunity to uh, learn from each other and see some other ideas from schools and what they are currently using for progress monitoring it with our K3 students. So you can go ahead and type what tool you're using in our chat box and then we will go ahead and continue. This slide is a sample of guided questions that are located on the FCRR website. And oftentimes with progress monitoring assessments, we as teachers receive a lot of data back. And sometimes determining exactly where the student is struggling can be difficult with the amount of data we receive back from progress monitoring assessments. So this chart serves as a very informal way of narrowing down the area in which a student may need additional support in. So these are simple questions that teachers can give to students and it just allows the opportunity to see where the area is. So again, this, uh, this chart is linked on the SCRR website under our four educators page, and that will also be uh, part of the PowerPoint slide and the resources available to you. 
In 2021, the U.S. Department of Education released a report outlining key factors um, to consider when implementing a tutoring of program. And so it's, I, it's important to understand effective based practices in order to create an effective tutoring program. So we're going to go over these recommendations. And again, we wanna note that these are recommendations for an effective tutoring program. They are not requirements for you to follow, but we um, would strongly suggest that they be considered as you are making some of your um, implementation decisions. So one of the first recommendations was that students should meet with their tutors at least three times per week. And research showed that this high dosage of tutoring and supplemental support over a specific period of time allowed for greater growth and improvement. And then with the three times per week, another element of that was the time of the sessions. So with considering our youngest learners, it, the research showed that the frequency of how many times students met with tutors was increased, but that they only met for about 30 minutes. As they moved into the second and third grade levels, students were able to um, meet with their tutors for a longer extended period of time, but not going over about a 50 minute mark. So again, with our younger students, we want to have more frequency of sessions, but shorter sessions. And with our older students, our second and third grade students, those frequency of sessions um, can be three times per week, but a little longer in, in time. Again, we covered this at the beginning, but tutors should be well-trained and supported, and this will be an ongoing process for um, district leaders and site leaders. It'll be important to include informal assessments to track um, the response to tutoring and to make sure that students are making growth as they receive um, tutoring instruction. The curriculum or the resources that are chosen should be aligned with the best standards. And so again, if you are um, thinking of implementing some of the student center activities, you can check that uh, link that says aligned with best and that will take care of that element for you. In-person tutoring is the goal. And with this initiative, we really want to work towards that, um, that goal is having the tutors on campuses and meeting with our students in person. However, online is effective as well. But again, the goal being in-person tutoring. When looking at group size, ideally your tutor should meet one-on-one -on -one with students, but we know that that can be challenging depending on how many tutors you have or how many uh, students qualify for tutoring services. So the research also showed that groups up to four were also effective, but we would really, um, we would really suggest not going over the four uh, to a group so that the um, sessions can remain effective. Allowing uh, tutors time to build relationships is going to be a really important element of um, the tutoring program. So we really want the tutors and students to have a positive, well-working relationship as they're working through their sessions. And then um, really um, striving to schedule sessions during the school day. And research showed that scheduling sessions during the school day did result in higher learning gains than after school. And scheduling sessions during the school day eliminated, uh, limit, eliminated excuse me, barriers such as transportation or conflicting with after school um, commitments or family commitments or sports and that students were, uh, their attendance improved with sessions scheduled during the school day because they were really looking forward to meeting with their um, tutor. However, that being said, we understand um, the opportunities that can arise with scheduling sessions during the school day. So after school was also shown to be effective, just not as effective um, as sessions uh, scheduled during the school day. And with after school tutoring, it was recommended that the students that participate in the after school tutoring, they, um, that is the only students that are there. So not just opening it to um, anybody in after school, but just having a specific after school tutoring program. And then additionally, the tutors would need to be um, supervised 
and have that ongoing support and guidance in the after school tutoring sessions. And then um, the additional layer to after school tutoring was um, allowing some hands on activities and some downtime for the students before the tutoring sessions began, um, given that they had been in school all day. So both can be effective if implemented correctly. And then again, targeting students that are below your district expectations. So again, these are recommendations. These are not requirements, but they would be um, elements that would be in, um, important to consider as you are working through this implementation process. So the US Department of Education report is very detailed and we will link it um, in our chat box. But the big takeaways again are to consider in-school tutoring sessions. So you have that aligned instruction with what is happening in the classroom. Consistent pairings between the student and the tutor. So not changing the tutor and the student grouping each week or in between sessions, trying to keep it consistent. Striving for that small group instruction. So ideally one-on-one, -on -one, but less than four. And then allowing time for tutors and teachers to collaborate, and then allowing time for teachers, tutors, and parents to also collaborate. So we wanted to take a minute in our chat box and ask you, what of, um, which of these elements do you feel will be the most difficult when implementing a tutoring program? And we ask this so that we can provide more targeted professional development and help um, you as you move through this implementation process and provide you with more resources on areas that may need additional guidance. So we'll give you a minute to look at these nine factors and tell us what you feel is going to be um, the most difficult when implementing a tutoring program. So one of the questions we have received frequently here at FCRR is when can tutoring begin? So tutoring can begin once students have uh, been identified and the criteria has been set and tutors have been recruited and trained on the materials that they will be using. And then lastly, that school sites have identified a space that is um, conducive to meeting with students and conducive to learning. So those are um, kind of the big elements that need to be considered before you um, begin tutoring. So as kind of a wrap up and a conclusion and um, guidance in your next steps moving forward, we've covered a lot of information, but we want um, to leave you with these next steps. So the first thing that you will need to decide is your implementation team. So really deciding on those key people that are going to be making the decisions moving forward, deciding on the program materials and resources that will be used, deciding on the criteria in which uh, students will be selected to receive uh, tutoring services, recruiting and training your tutors, um, making sure your progress monitoring tool is in place and that it accurately measures student growth and achievement. And then lastly, identifying that conducive space to learning at the school sites. The um, Department of Education has allocated funds to districts at this point, and the program performance period for this initiative is January 1st. 2022 to September 30th, 2023. And it is important for our districts and administrative teams to be aware of the assurances that are listed in the grant and um, contact Department of Education with any questions regarding budget or funds. And then districts and administrative teams may contact myself, which is jbason at fsu.edu with questions regarding implementation for tutoring or um, resources or guidance in uh, deciding on resources. And, um, or if you just need additional support with working through um, some of these decisions that we are making and that we talked about today. So at this time, you have completed part one of the K-3 tutor training program. 
Again, I'm Dr. Julie Baisden here at the Florida Center for Reading Research at Florida State University. And I wanna truly take, um, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us and learn more about um, effective practices when it comes to implementing your tutoring program. And we have about nine minutes left in our scheduled webinar today. So what we're gonna do with the remaining time is open our question and answer box all right, looks like we have a question about documentation from schools, what will need to be um, submitted and to whom, where do we collect that information? Yes, you collect it as the district, so you'll use your project performance accountability form and you will um, keep anything that you've listed down as evidence to match your scope of work and your deliverables and they'll be kept at your district. Uh, we are still working out the plan for the FCRR um, evaluation, so if we need to collect anything from you um, regarding that, we'll be in touch, but for now, just keep everything safe with your district. All right. Well, if there's no other further questions, we will go ahead and end our webinar for this afternoon. Again, thank you so much for attending. And please let us know if there's anything we can do to support you in your efforts to implement a tutoring program. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone.